Many churches are having a message that will be somewhat different than what I'm going to have today. And people feel that they're obligated to talk about what the world is celebrating at this time of year. I will say this much. I got a phone call from Ed Bender yesterday when Debbie and I were walking. And he was uh, saying that he uh, worked with a woman who was an atheist for all the years that he knew her but he got a Christmas card from her. <laughs> and he just had to call and talk about that. So, And so I'll let you think about that. Okay, our subject today is faith. There are lots of different ways that we could talk about this and a lot of different ways that would be right, including I could have a list two pages long of references that use the word faith, and we could talk about that, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not saying that that's wrong. There's, there's a time and place for that kind of a study. There's, uh, we could go through and look at a list of people that were faithful, and we're not going to do that today. That also has a lot of value, but I'm going to just kind of focus, and not on a, on a really deep level, but we're just going to talk about the word faith, what it means, why it's different than other words, that kind of thing. I have a, a kind of a, a twisted quote here at the bottom. It says, faith, when the Son of Man comes, will he find it? And I give you that reference, Luke 18.8. 8. You can read that sometime. Read it and look at, look at it in context, what's going on. I will tell you that Jesus does answer the question, Will there be faith at the end? And the answer is, yes, there will be. How do we know? Because he also said that when he comes, there will be two sleeping in one bed, one taken, and the other left. Two working in the field, one taken, the other left. Two grinding at the mill, one taken, and the other left. And the Apostle Paul tells us that there will be those who are alive and remain at his coming. So the question is answered, yes, there will be, but you have to ask yourself, why did Jesus say, will there be? And I think it's because, as we talked about in the adult lesson this morning, there's a lot of leverage being applied to pull faith out of the picture. And we have to see that. I think that's an important thing for us to acknowledge, is that the world is trying to undo, to unravel the faith that we have for various reasons. No, it, it seems to be a truism in humans that they don't like it when there's somebody in the room that might be right or that thinks they're right. It's just part of human nature. And they have names like goody two-shoes and things like that that they apply to people who they think think they're better or that they're afraid might be. And that's part of understanding this. Let's see if I can get this thing to work here. There we go. Pretty stone. Why? Faith is multifaceted to understand the word. Why do we have so many words that kind of cover the same territory that overlap? Belief or to believe, right? Trust or trustworthy. And of course, faith, obey or obedience. Do you see how these things overlap? If you don't, then you probably need to look at the definitions of the words, but why do we have so many words? Because there are subtle differences between them, and we have to know the difference, know when to use which one. What is the difference between the three things I have on the screen here? To be faithful, a faithful witness, and faith. 
The one at the bottom is a noun, right? You have one that's an adverb and one that's an adjective. An adverb is something that explains a verb or gives you more information about a particular verb, which is an action. And an adjective gives you more information about a subject. Well, faithful servant, servant is the subject. Faithful expresses what kind of servant, right? To be faithful, that would be an adverb, because be is the verb. And faithful tells you what you are to be. And faith is a noun. But it, but it doesn't stop there, because it's two-directional. Are we talking about us? Are we talking about someone else? Okay, it may be three-directional, because we might be talking about God. Is God faithful? Is he trustworthy? Okay, so we have to see all the aspects of this before we have to understand what the word means before we move on very far, right, in the process. Next screen, please. I like onions. Derek thinks I like them too much. <laughs> have three things on here quantity, quality, and depth. And all of these have overlap, don't they? Quantity, quality, and depth, they have overlap in what they mean. But how does this relate to faith? And I have the onion there because you could peel off the layers and go deeper into the onion, right? It isn't just something you could slice, but there's actually depth into that, right? Quantity, quality, and depth. And think about what the difference, the differences are between those three things. Quantity and depth might be really closely related. Quality and quantity might be really well, related. And quality and depth might right. be really related. So try it. Related. But they said that yeah, doesn't all work. All of them could affect each other when we're I talking mean, I, about I faith. did wait for it to like reset it? itself. How deep is it? And it didn't. Let but it might maybe a little not further. have cooled off completely. You might have a lot of knowledge, but very little faith, okay? Or you might have a lot of knowledge and have a lot of faith. And it might be that you have faith, but not very deep. Some people tend to be, or can be, have the ability to be more believing with less information that I might be believing with. Let me just say it that way. I see some people that are able to believe without having as much evidence as it takes for me. And I'm not saying that I, it's good that I'm that way. I'm just admitting that. It takes more for me, I think, to believe than it does some people. But we have to see all these things as possibilities. I'm going to talk about some different biblical phrases. The one I'm not going to talk about much, but I'm going to say it right now. I'm not going to put it on the screen. If we say, what does faith mean? And you quote to me Hebrews 11, 1. If you quote it to my brother, he'll probably convulse. But, and, that, and I understand why. That verse, which says, faith is the, what? Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen or unseen things, right? That is not a definition of faith. That anytime we have language that's analogous, or it's an, it's an analogy, or it's a, a simile, or a metaphor used in a parable or something like that, it is only tied to the context. Here's an exam a couple examples that I made a note for myself. Love is blind. Is that always true? Love never fails. Is that always true? But it can be an aspect of it. It can be a facet of it. Or it can be a characteristic of some people that exercise those things. Right? 
So when we hear faith is the substance of things hoped for, it's saying it is the source of it. It is an action of faith. Faith is where you get and understand. It allows you to have substance in your mind, in your imagination, for things that you hope for. It allows you to accept the evidence and is built on the evidence of things not seen. Okay. Next, please. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Notice I don't have a reference on this. We're going to look at the reference in a little bit, but I want you to think about just this, this phrase here. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Why does it say it this way? Why doesn't it just say faith comes by hearing the Word of God? What's the difference grammatically? Or what, what's the author trying to tell us? Faith doesn't just come because you have ears on the side of your head. Faith doesn't just come because you have perceptive abilities. There's an ingredient that has to be entered in here. It's not just hearing, but it's hearing or perceiving, understanding, and obeying the Word of God. There is no other means by which faith can be achieved. Now maybe, and usually as children, we begin this process of building our faith because someone else is reading the Word of God to us. And that might be the case for all blind people, right? And certainly, you don't have the same book I have. Yours is down there, mine's up here. Some of them in different versions, some of them maybe even in different languages. But we trust that the source is the same, that we're reading the same kind of information. But the source of faith is the Word of God. The question is, do you believe that? This morning we talked in the adult lesson about a lot of people who don't believe that. They say that well, that book is full of inconsistencies. It doesn't agree with the other historical records, and thus I don't buy it. You have to ask yourself, do I? Next screen. Here's another phrase from the Bible. Notice no verse. We're going to get there. But the just shall live by faith. Do we understand this phrase? I'm going to read it with different emphasis. When I was a kid, we used to have a little joke that we would say, you put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. If you don't read something right, if you don't understand how it's being approached, and that usually requires some context, then you may get different meanings. And sometimes a phrase may have more than one meaning. You could emphasize the first word, but, which tells you that all of a sudden we're comparing one thing to another. This is this, but that is that. Okay? But the just shall live by faith. But the just shall live by faith. But the just shall live by faith. All are true, but all have a slightly different understanding. If you emphasize the word just, then that would force you to think about those that are unjust, those that are wicked. If you emphasize the word live, ah, now all of a sudden we have to determine. Are we contextually talking about now? And that can apply to the phrase, man does not live by bread alone, or shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Are we talking about what we're going to have for lunch today and whether that carries us through till tomorrow? Or are we talking something much further, or we hope not very far in our future, that lasts forever? Which is it that we're talking about? Are we talking about we live now? And if we talk about living now, are we talking about just being sustained? Or are we talking about a lifestyle? The just shall have a lifestyle that is faithful. I think that's true. And I've heard that used that way a lot, especially by modern-day Christians, implying that we're going to live faithful today because there's good things we get out of that today. I hope we're going to see in the verses that we're going to read here in a little bit, but that, isn't, that was not the intent of the original writers was not the intent of God when he spoke to Habakkuk and said that in an answer, that the just will live by faith. But let's move to the next slide. Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4. Now, it's probably important that we talk a little bit about Habakkuk so we know the context more than just the words that we're reading. Habakkuk lived and prophesied in the times of the death throes of Judah. Okay? He was just before the Babylonians came down and took them captive. Many prophets had come before foretelling what God was going to do as a result of Israel and Judah's disobedience, their lack of faithfulness, let's say, right? that he told them what he was going to do, and they went, ah, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in our lifetime. He isn't going to pull it off. I mean, everything just keeps on going the way it is. And Habakkuk writes in this fashion. It's the question-response, question-response. So Habakkuk starts off asking God, why don't you hear? Why don't you see what's going on? Look at the wickedness that's going on. Look at the, the cruelty that's going on in our nation. Why don't you hear? And God responds, okay, you look at the nations around you because out of those nations is going to come your downfall. And so we begin the reading here in chapter 2, verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Next screen, please. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. I'm going to pause here for a second. Was he talking about in that life right then? Now, there may have been an aspect in which some of those who were believers would be hid from the things that were going to happen. But remember that a lot of the ones that were hid, hid through death. When that came on them, they were hid either because they died before, had a gentle death in the process, or they went into captivity and they lived their lives away from where they grew up and knew his home. That was the escape. Or is he talking about there is a day of salvation and that salvation depends on your faithfulness. Don't cast away your confidence. Believe that what I said 
is going to happen, is going to happen. Both the bad that was coming on them immediately thereafter and the good that was prophesied future to that. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. What contextually is the subject? Salvation. It's not living in this life or things that would come to you in this life, it's looking to that life that comes through obedience in this life. Next screen, please. Romans 1, 16 through 18. I noticed that I didn't announce that. I don't remember saying where we were reading in Hebrews there. Hebrews 10. This one, Romans 1. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And I believe that this is two different uses of the word faith. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, or from believable item to believable item. And the just shall live. They shall gain eternal life by living according to those believable items, those articles, those items of faith, those items that we should believe in, that we should hear and perceive and practice. For, and I know I say it a lot, because the wrath of God, and why is it important to know the word for or because? Because it makes the connection. It says, what I just told you, if you don't get this, this is going to happen. Or if you do get it, this will happen. It's, it's a cause and effect. Or it's a connection. One is tied to the other. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteous or ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I think that's what we were talking about somewhat in the class this morning. What I heard Brandon saying last week, do you remember what he talked about last week? spurred some of this. I liked what I heard. I liked what I heard Keith saying the week before that. Do you remember what he talked about? Food, right? The Word of God as food and how we should eat that and take it in, understanding what it meant to eat the bread, drink the cup, and clear before that what it meant to take in the prophecies and understand them acknowledge them, and know what they were going to bring about, good and bad. Right? Next screen. Galatians 3, 11 and 12. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for or because the just shall live by faith not works in the law. Yet, so he's going to tell you, okay, step back again and look at this because I'm not saying something else. We well, need to pick that up in the language. Yet, the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. So he's not saying you can't do the laws or you shouldn't obey the laws. You have to obey the laws, but what's going to save you is your faith. Because just obeying the law 
by rote isn't enough. You have to obey it because you believe. One has to drive the other. And if you believe, then you will see the necessity of obeying the law. So, you can't be saved without it. You're not saved by it, but you can't be saved without it, coming to the law. And faith is what drives all of that. The acceptance of the law, obedience to the law, belief in its reward. Next screen, please. Faith comes by hearing. Okay? Do you want faith? What quality? What quantity? What depth? Do you think maybe there's a connection to how much hearing you do? And how much it you've heard? The job of us as teachers is first to make a student, someone who's interested, aware of it, right? They aren't going to look at it if they aren't even aware of it. Second is to help them shortcut. And that can be done a lot of ways. One way is to say, Here's where you start reading, okay? Read this first, when you get done, then read this. To give them an order, right? All, all courses of education are done that way. We don't start with, with calculus. We start with mathematics or, you know, arithmetic, right? We go to algebra, then we go to maybe uh, geometry and trigonometry and then calculus. And there's a reason why. You have to have certain understandings before you can proceed. And the Word of God is basically the same way. Not that it's going to hurt someone to open the book of Ezekiel and start reading, but I'm here to tell you they're probably not going to get much. If they don't first have some understanding of history and understand well, there's a reason why Genesis is first, you know, and Revelation is last. There's just a reason why. And most people, when I talk to them, they want to know about Revelation. And it's like the last place we should, should really dive deep. But that's the role of a teacher, is to give them shortcuts, to say, start here. Let me, let me show you something here. You seem to be struggling with this concept. Let me show you th three simple verses that will help you get this, right? And then they go, okay. And then you can use that as a foundation to move on. Faith comes by hearing. If we don't instruct people what to hear, it doesn't mean they won't eventually have faith. It's just the process becomes a lot longer. Okay, next screen, please. Romans 10, 16 through 18. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Okay, I, I want to make sure you get that. They have not all obeyed the gospel because Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And this was said in Isaiah 53, which by my simple math skills says there were 52 chapters before that that he's talking about. They haven't believed what we said. And who's the they? Well, all you got to do is read Isaiah 1, and it'll tell you who he was writing to. Tells you what kings. Yeah. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, during that time period of the kings of Judah, about Judah and Jerusalem, to learn who he's talking to, says they haven't believed our report. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Did Israel hear the words of God? Well, people were saying them. 
This is a good lesson in what it means to hear. Lots of prophets said, hey, you need to get rid of your gods, your false gods. You need to worship me. You need to start treating each other real nice, and then maybe I won't do bad things. But I'm going to do bad things because you aren't listening. And it's in that context that we understand faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There were also false prophets at the time of Isaiah. Right? Read the book of Isaiah, it'll tell you. Read the book of Jeremiah, it will tell you of the false prophets that were prophesying, nothing bad's going to happen. Go ahead, king, go to war. You're going to win. The, the Babylonians are not going to come down. You can take that yoke off your neck. They were saying good things. They weren't good in the end because they were not true. So that's the context in which faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you want quantitative, qualitative, and depth in your faith, then you have to delve deep into the Word of God. And if you don't want that, then understand that your faith will be shallow. It doesn't mean you can't have some, but it speaks to the depth that you'll have. It will only be as de deep as the knowledge that you have of God and His plan and the degree to which you understand it. So if you read prophecies, and they don't make sense to you, my suggestion is read them again, and then read them again, and then read them again. And I'm not talking about read Ezekiel 15 times in a row. That might not be bad. Read all of them, because all of them help you understand all of the others. And you want to understand them if you don't have the history. So you're pretty much stuck to read at least, or have some read to you, Genesis 1 <laughs> through the end of the book of Acts, anyway, right? To understand the history. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Oh, If we saw where this was quoted from in the book of Psalms, we'd understand that this isn't actually God speaking words as we would understand words, but God said in the beginning, let there be. Second Peter 3 says it this way, by the word of God, everything was there. And then the flood came and washed it away. And by the same word, he says, the future kingdom of God is going to come. But it's all by the word of God. That's why John says in chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. Because it all started with, and God said. So what happened when God said? The world was created, right? And their word, those words, went to the ends of the world. And we all have that as evidence. So Isaiah and Paul are saying, yeah, those words went out. Everybody had the same opportunity to hear, see, understand that. But they didn't hear. And so it still comes down to belief, doesn't it? Next slide, please. Strugglers, just this is a reminder, this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, right? People who struggle to have faith, Balaam, right? Can I go? No. Can I go? Yes. Donkey, what are you doing? Saul, we've been reading the stories of David and Saul. Did he struggle to believe? 
Did Jonah struggle? Did Nebuchadnezzar struggle? I mean, how much sign do you need? Four guys in the fire. Three went in, four in there. Three come out, not even smell like smoke. And the other things that happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He had the benefit of receiving a very vivid dream, one that he was able to remember the details of, in color, and have it explained to him, right? Thomas, did he have some trouble believing? And notice I didn't go the ones that didn't struggle in the next list. It's, no, the ones that just struggled harder. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, David, because we're not reading the entire 11th chapter of Hebrews today. Next screen, please. John 20. Okay, Joel. Joel got a couple of them this morning. Good for you. I wish that somebody had brought up all of them. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Notice, all of these texts are about getting eternal life because you believed. It's not about what you do in this life and what you get. Because many of those people didn't get stuff we want to get in this life, including Jesus. They killed him. He didn't even live to a ripe old age. Next slide, please. Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Do you want to be perfect or do you want to be imperfect? Do you want to have depth or do you want to be shallow? Do you want to have a little faith or a lot of faith? <laughs> Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Now those could be some pretty heady things. And how many of the people in the world understand these things? But this author is saying, and I believe it's Paul, is saying, but we need to move on to perfection. I believe it's Paul because he talks about being in bonds. The author does. Of the doctrine of all these things, he says, these are all good things to know, but we need to move on. He says, and this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to notice all these categories. They were enlightened, so they heard it. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They received blessings from God. They've become partakers of the Holy Spirit. They have the Spirit of God in them. Next screen, please. And have tasted... Remember what Keith was talking about? And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If you've gone that far and you get that much depth in your understanding and faith and you turn away from this, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And this can be talking about the church in general and what has happened to the church historically from the time of the apostles till now. And I'm not talking about just Church of God in Kashmir or anywhere else. I'm talking about the church, all those that claim Christianity, what has happened to them? Did they start off in an enlightened position? 
Where did they go? What do some of them do as far as the subject of transubstantiation goes? Do they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame? Do we do that if we know all these things, believe all these things, and turn away? For the earth which drinks and the rain... At the, Pause here for a second. Think how much this sounds like Isaiah 55, for those who know that chapter. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. Yep, in this life we do. That's not saying we won't in the future. I'm saying we have to acknowledge in this life we do receive those blessings. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. And then note at the bottom of the page, 1 Peter 2, 3 says, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Do we like to eat the Word of God? Yeah. Keith pointed out that those two prophets that ate that, it was sweet like honey in their mouth, but it made their belly bitter. Why? When you understand that what God is really saying is death to billions. And a lot of bad things happening in the process. Wars, destruction. But if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Next screen. We, we are going to get there a little bit, right? A little from Hebrews 6, we kind of have to, in closing. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So if you think you can get out of this thing without some faith, it's not going to happen. You have to have some. The question is, what quantity, what quality, how deep? For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is re a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What's the connection? I hope it's obvious, right? If you're not diligently seek him, your faith will be shallow. Well, I'm thankful that we have the word of God so that we can approach him. Let's close with a song. Two hundred and thirty-nine. I'm no. I'm sorry. Two thirty-eight. The peace that my Savior has given. Number two thirty-eight. Two hundred and thirty-eight. We stand as we sing. <laughs>
loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that we have been allowed to come together to not only thank you, but to acknowledge you. We pray that as we go to our homes now that you would give us safe passage, grant us the safety and the privilege to return again. We pray for all those that are scattered across the earth of your people that are trying to please you, that you would guide and protect and comfort and heal. We do pray that you will send Jesus soon and grant us a place in your kingdom on that day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.